took over this farm in 1992. It was owned by Lord Allerton. Um, he left it to the trust. It was originally three farms, so there's quite a lot of agricultural history here. The visitor centre was a, a dairy parlour, actually. So they're milking cows. Um, Michael, who's just come to resuscitate the lamb that was so fast asleep it didn't uh, wake us up, um, has worked here for 50 years. He says one of the main crops was potatoes. Uh, so some of the better land could probably just about have managed potatoes. We don't grow potatoes now and I think that's probably two reasons. One is that uh, potatoes are a much more specialist job than they were in those days but I suspect that our soils have deteriorated such that it really doesn't, uh, wouldn't be possible really to, to get the clods out. Um, so there's a couple of lessons in that really. But uh, there were three types of farming when we inherited in 92. There was permanent pasture, so that was really all the land that couldn't go under the plough because it was too heavy. Um, there was arable, which was the land that could. And then there was something called permanent set-aside, which I suspect was the land that was in arable that was very difficult to manage. And Lord Allerton was a great fan of permanent set-aside. I think he liked the idea of doing nothing and getting paid for it. I suspect if he'd lived a lot longer, the whole farm would have been permanent set aside. I know Michael was worried for his job, uh, the lack of farming that was going on. Uh, but I've stopped in this particular field for a reason, because this was actually one of the fields that was in permanent pasture. And when we took over, uh, it's probably fair to say that the farm was being farmed extensively, which in agricultural language is badly. And um, the number of sheep that we had um, was far less than the pasture that it could support. I suspect that sheep numbers were determined by the size of the sheds which we lambed into. Um, so we didn't want to expand the flock because we'd get into difficulties uh, over at lambing time. Um, so the decision was made to take some of the permanent pasture out of permanent pasture and put it into arable. And that's really when you learn why it had been put into permanent pasture. And of course, we had the benefit of 15 years of arable cropping in here. This wasn't the only field, the next field across came out as well. Uh, we had the benefit of 15 years of the residue of, of the grass in the arable sequence, but then it got more and more difficult to farm this and uh, black grass became a major problem. And so we took the decision four years ago to put this back into a temporary grass lay. Um, and so we've, we've grazed this really ever since. Um, we finished the four year sequence by grazing the land down hard um, to graze off as much of the grass residue as we could. And that played nicely into our hands because of course grass was short last summer. So the shepherd didn't need any persuasion in that direction. The, the downside of it was, of course, last summer, and you'll have seen this actually in the agroforestry project, you see that the cracks have not yet closed up from, from last year. Well, we're the same in here. And that means that when you come to sow in here, that's going to create a, a slight problem. So we, do, we don't want to plough because after we've gone through the grass phase, the arable weeds, which are in the germination zone, will have either been either germinated, um, got grazed off, or the seeds will have died or be predated. So the surface of your soil has had no fresh arable weed seed shed for four years, yet anything that was left from the arable period will have been depleted. If we then plough that, we bring up that dormant seed bank, and believe you me, things like charlock and poppies can stay dormant for a very long time. You bring that in, up into the germination zone, and then you've got to start fighting that problem. So we know that blackgrass shows a 90% decline in three years. I don't suspect it does 100% in four. I'm pretty sure it doesn't because we see blackgrass even after four years of, of this. But, but we've got a fighting chance to, to make a clean start. So what we want to do is to direct drill into this. But therein lies another problem. Sheep are very good at compacting the very top of the soil. In fact, in the Industrial Revolution, whenever you built a canal, you lined it with clay and you ran sheep up and down it 
because that was the best way to get a seal. And that's exactly what they do in a field like this, particularly when it gets wet. So we need to take that surface compaction out without bringing up soil from deep down that's got dormant weed seeds in it. And we do that by bringing in what we call a load disturbance subsoiler. And this is a very clever machine. It's not like the old subsoilers that heave the soil up and leave big lumps on the surface. It goes through and it causes some vertical shattering, which takes that compaction out without bringing the soil up, which means you can then go in straight behind and drill. Now, obviously a bit challenging here because of the cracks that we had here, so some of the blocks did come up. So we whipped the rolls over just to get some consolidation there. Then we went in with the direct drill and then we rolled again afterwards. And as you can see, that that seems to have more or less worked. It's a bit patchy in here, but I'm not concerned about it. I think we've got sufficient plant numbers that we'll get a decent crop out of here. It will be very cheap to grow. It won't need much herbicide and it will lead less nitrogen than a, a normal crop of wheat. And what we're interested to see now is how long we can push this arable phase before we have to go back to grass again. I suspect we can probably do seven or eight, but we'll wait and see. The field that we're, that's three years ahead of this, I was horrified to find we found black grass in the first year uh, without ploughing. So that was a disappointment, but it wasn't very vigorous and we put a crop of um, hybrid barley in as the second crop in that rotation and that gave it a really good smothering. Um, we've now gone into rape, which we can use propizamide to control that and it looks very good. So I'm fairly optimistic that we're going to be able to, to keep that going. So um, as you can see, we've got a lot of grass residue on the surface, but what I'm really interested in, you see there already the, the worms that we've got in here these were pretty much extinct before we went into the grass phase but this would have been incredibly blocky earth before and now you can see all that dead root mass is not only helping to hold the soil together and reduce erosion and believe me this slope is steep enough to erode but it's also slowly breaking down releasing nutrients and we've got this really fantastic root structure you can see look there there's the roots of the wheat coming through um, so I'm, um, I'm optimistic that this is a really good sustainable way for us to, to be farming going forward. And at the moment we're trying to persuade DEFRA to include um, the addition of grass into all arable rotations as an environmental land management option. You don't have to have livestock. I ran a stockless organic farm for 10 years. Uh, so we did use no livestock at all. We never took the straw off. We didn't take any forage off. We grew grass and red clover and we cut and mulched it a bit like we used to manage set aside for those of you who remember the early days of set aside. And so what you're doing is you're composting back the green material straight back to the soil. So instead of taking the pathway of green matter, animal, manure, soil, back to the plant, you're simply going soil, plant, back to the soil, back to the plant. So it's a tighter, um, it, it's tighter sequence and you can conserve the nutrient better actually because livestock is quite leaky so you lose quite a lot of the nutrients in that. But it, in an 18 month uh, period of grass and clover uh, we were able to grow uh, 8 tonne crops of wheat after that without using any fertiliser. It's extraordinary when you think you need about 21 kilos per, per tonne of wheat, that's a biological requirement, that meant that that clover and that grass together supplied over 200 kilos of nitrogen to that crop of wheat and of course it controlled the weeds as well. So this is what we're after, uh, improving the soil, making it easier to farm um, and giving us uh, a profit, profitable sequence of crops uh, along the way. Uh, there's some other work going on um, in relation to the all arable system where we're direct drilling and comparing it with plough and min till and we've got some really interesting ecological benefits coming from that particularly for farmland birds in the winter time we know that one of the pinch points for farmland birds is the availability of food through the winter time and when we plough we bury all the crop residues and the spilt grain and the weed seeds down and the birds can't get to them when we direct drill we leave them and interestingly we're finding a lot of insects as well 
uh, survive in the stubble and it's very noticeable to see when we're doing the transects in winter time that the birds are all on the direct drilled side of the field. So there's a lot to be benefit out of this but there are challenges involved in it as well and I, I'm not sure we'd be able to do this without that combination of a, of a direct drill and the, the subsoiler. They seem to work together. Now you may know that some direct drillers believe that all you should do is direct drill and you shouldn't move the soil at all. I think when you get enough earthworms you can get away with that and certainly in the field uh, across on the hill there which has been direct drilled for nine years now the earthworm population went from 200 per cubic meter to 700 per cubic meter and I just know that I can walk across that field within two hours of it having rained without it sticking to my boots and we could never have done that before that's a huge difference so I think in the fullness of time, earthworm populations building up may help with this, but until you get to that stage, the subsoil is a key bit of equipment. What depth are you going with your subsoil? We literally dig to see where we need to go, and once we've identified where the compaction comes to end, we, we set the subsoiler to take that out and that depth. So really, um, as little as possible, but as much as necessary. Yeah. But your sheep, your sheep are only compacting yes, very they are. The exactly, they are. Yeah. But but just that movement of breaking that up is enough to open that up. Yeah. Are you? Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's all right. You said you were putting. Yeah. You'll be putting less nitrogen on. Here. Yes. Are you testing that? Yes. So we use something called N Plan. So we take a soil sample uh, in February. We send it off to the lab, and we use that figure in a computer program, which takes into account any other sources of nitrogen. The, uh, past cropping history of the land and that gives us a three split recommendation and usually the middle split it cuts, can cut anything up to 40 to 60 kilos of nitrogen out of that application so well how just the, the, the no you'll year. also get it in the second crop second, as well right. the third one probably not but we'll wait and see yeah yeah, yeah. sorry Stuart I'm standing want to create a snail seedbed. Um, the guy doesn't come to bale it for a fortnight. In the meantime it's rained so he can't get it. He then runs all over the field with his trailer and his baler. Uh, you know the sort of farm trailer I'm talking about with Morris Minor wheel tyres <laughs> on you know all over the field and he says don't worry Alistair I'll bring you the manure back and then he runs all over the field with the muck spreader and that means that we, we can't operate the system because we've got to do intensive tillage then to take all that compaction out. So I prefer to chop straw back. There's evidence from our cover crop work that it's very useful in feeding the worms. We do have a trash rake, you might have seen that as we walk past. Um, on this slope, when you're trying to chop straw on a day like today with the wind blowing, you can't spread it wide enough, so it lands in clumps. So we just run the trash rake through it and that just scatters that straw out and that enables us to do it. That said, last year we were mercenary and we bailed some straw to sell it because this is a, a large livestock area and people were going to be short of forage and we felt that you know, we would make some available. So we did um, bale. So anything that wasn't actually in a, in a trial was, was bailed, but obviously the, the trials, we have to keep the system the same <coughs> because of the measurements we're doing. Yeah. Was this just grass and clover out here? Or was it yeah, else in just grass and clover, this one, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, just white clover, yeah. Have you done any other mixes? We're going to have a look at one in a minute. Right, okay. Yes, that's where we're going to next. We're, we're on a journey here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How long was this build down to grass for? Four years. four years. This was four years. The previous one we did three, and we saw black grass in that. Yeah. I, I, I'll wait and see. Once it goes into head, I know what it is. 